Okay. This presentation is on plant ID apps, in particular, iNaturalist and how it compares to others. So remember these phones from long ago, the flip phone and the candy bar phone? So mobile phones used to look like these in 2007. And if you think about it, 2007 doesn't seem that long ago. So back then, convenience meant the ability to call anyone without being tethered to a cord. But texting meant having to punch keys several times in order to get the correct letter. So let's say you're spelling something as simple as cat. You'd have to punch the number one key three times to get the letter C, punch the number one key again once for A, and then punch the number eight key for the letter T. So it took a long time to text back then. And um, I also recall being so proud back then with my candy bar shaped phone, the one on the right, because it was able to take two megapixel photos. And back then that was a big deal. These days, 16 megapixels is the norm. And as for apps, well, back then we went, Apps, what are those, appetizers? Nokia was said to have introduced the first mobile app in 1997, believe it or not. And it was an arcade game called Snake. Applications or apps for short turned mainstream in 2008, thanks to Apple. And so here's what happened in 2007, Apple developed the first Apple smartphone. And a year later, they introduced the Apple App Store. And that's why we saw commercials that um, made the slogan so familiar to us, there's an app for that. So most of the apps back then were games like Texas Hold'em, Solitaire. There was even an interactive um, koi pond. And it was quite simple. Um, so you'd see koi fish swimming on your screen, and then if you tapped the water, it would create ripples. And I think that was it. So, but back then that was like a big deal. And it also offered Pandora Radio, Google Earth, a flashlight app, etc. So here's a fun fact. These days, when you want um, for developers to make an app for you that's like basic you will have to invest at least $60,000 to about $150,000. But with the bells and whistles, uh, that would mean it would be a more complex development. You have to be ready to invest at least $300,000. So also around that time, 2008, 2011, uh, this is the Smithsonian Institute Columbia, Columbia University and the University of Maryland began developing LeafSnap. So LeafSnap is actually the first plant ID app. And that dashing gentleman over there is Dr. John Kess, and he was co-creator of LeafSnap. So the thing that made it um, unique was that it only identified trees and you needed a white background. So Dr. Kess here is shown holding a piece of um, white paper with a leaf glued onto it. Because back then, the computer would, would only be able to recognize the certain tree if it were um, on a, if the leaf was on a white background. So, Using an algorithm similar to facial recognition, LeafSnap was um, able to, the, to take a, the, the study the pattern of the leaves and was able to identify, as I said, only trees. And over time, its developers um, included other plant species in their database, but by then other plant ID apps had already been developed. Today's apps are, as we know, convenient. They are compatible to both iOS or 
uh, Apple smartphones for short, and Android smartphones. And whether you're in any part of the state or any part of the globe, you can actually submit, comment on, and share discoveries and contribute to citizen science projects. So here we see four bubbles. One bubble is related to ID apps that can help you identify houseplants. Some um, are to ID plant diseases, and, and yet others uh, will help you identify exotic plants that you see, let's say, at the botanical garden or when you're in Costa Rica or whatever. But we're going to be focusing on the fourth bubble. So our focus will be on apps that are relevant to those wanting to identify native plants. Why? Because there are a plethora of ID apps available, which are about 200 plant ID apps. We'll have us talking for hours. So I selected only six of the most popular picks by online reviewers. And ironically, LeafSnap didn't make it to our list because it um, really works well only in locations such as Washington, DC, Canada, New York, and the northern northeastern US. So I don't know why. <laughs> So the next two slides will feature apps that are essentially free. The first one is PlantSnap. So the pros are it has beautiful pics of, of plants and they have a very organized taxonomy info. And they even offer basic tutorials and instructions for new users and it's easy to use. As for the cons, you can't use the app without creating an account. And um, the free version, because they said that this is free. Uh, so there's a free version, but there's a pro version uh, that costs money. The free version only provides you very limited um, restrictions on using the app versus the one that would charge you money. So, um, and another thing about the free Plant snap version is that it is inundated with ads. And one of the ads that seems to be um, pushed fairly hard is the monthly premium subscription of $2.99. Other options range from 99 cents, which would be good for five plant IDs. And then there's the $19.99 for a premium yearly subscription up to $39.99 for lifetime premium subscription. So um, there were also reviews saying that the plant information varies either, either from very detailed or you barely get information on the plant that you're wanting to get identified. Next one is PlantNet. So the pros. It's similar to iNaturalist in that it is citizen, a citizen science project and it is community driven. You, um, you don't need to provide your credit card information and like other apps, it's 100% free and you can browse a directory of plants by family, genus or species. You may upload a picture of specific parts of the plant, such as the leaf, the fruit, the bark, which is, which I think is great because that way you can have a really accurate ID of your discovery. So for the cons, you're also required to create an account to share your observations. And a reviewer said that the database still needs to grow and also, um, you can only confirm an ID if a similar plant is already in the PlantNet database. Another reviewer observed that the app does a better job of identifying plants photographed against a white background. So it's kind of similar to LeafSnap. So if, but, so if you want to identify a plant outdoors 
or when you're on the go, I don't think you'd be bringing a white piece of paper with you. So plant net may not be as accurate than if without that white background. So that's why um, it's not really an app that I would recommend. So moving on to paid apps. We have two examples as well. So the first one is Flower Checker. It was created by three friends with PhDs in botany uh, and Flower Checker identifies itself as a concierge service instead of just a typical plant ID app. So instead of using algorithms, actual botanists and horticulturists are see the app user's photo and IDs the plant. So the app has actually received many five-star reviews. So for, for the pros, it's ad-free because you pay for it. <laughs> and the plant is ID'd by an actual person, not an art, artificial, artificial intelligence, not AI. And you even have the, the option to, to chat with a botanist. So uh, for, the, for the cons, this only works with a Google account. And I don't know, maybe a vast majority of people own Google accounts, but there are still some that don't. So it only works with a Google account. And um, it costs a dollar per ID and wait times to get your, the verification of your observation could be in minutes. Sometimes it would take hours. Sometimes it would take a whole day. And so um, some one star reviews allegedly accused Google and Flower Checker of tracking and collecting user information. And another interviewer who, um, so that's one of the cons that they claim that Flower Checker and Google tracks your info and app use. Another reviewer who waited a while to receive an expert answer was disappointed that in the end, you know, after maybe 24 hours of waiting, the botanists couldn't identify the plant that they uploaded. Next is picture this. So the pros, it claims 98 to 99% accuracy in identifying common species. It even gives you ideas on plant care, like, and also um, when to water your plants, the common pests that um, that love plants such as what you have, pruning and propagation tips. And for $25, you can even chat with a botanist. A large number of reviewers use picture this to identify and care for house plants and traditional garden plants. So of the reviewers, um, the most of them preferred to use this whenever they would get a house plant from a box store. Yeah, but then they um, and they want to know in for more information about the plant so and so, or someone had gifted them a plant and it didn't have the tag. So they use picture this to learn more about this plant. So um, the people who have downloaded this to their phone said that they were very impressed with the wealth of information received instantaneously. And like flower checker that maybe you have to wait a few minutes. Sometimes it's instantaneous, sometimes it not, it's not. But picture this, it's guaranteed you'll get an answer immediately after you share your observation. So one reviewer liked that the app showed photos of the plant in various stages of growth. So I think that that's really interesting. Now for the cons. So your, because this is a paid app, your card information is required in order to use the app. And they say, we are actually going to give you a seven day free trial, which draws in people. But then, like I said, you have to submit your credit card info. And the weird thing is, they seem to not remind you that your seven day free trial would, is, is about to expire. And so 
when that happens, which reviewers say it has happened many times, the card that you just input into the system becomes auto charged charged for a year subscription. So um, the so there was also a reviewer who took photos of of 10 plants, but only got seven of them correctly identified. And the most common complaint about picture this is the requirement of your card info. And um, as you can see in the cons, um, it could even cost about $66.99 for an annual premium subscription. And the viewers also mentioned that it seemed very difficult to cancel and contact the developers. Um, one said that they had to search Google for a way to cancel their subscription. They don't make it so they don't make it easy to cancel. Picture this on purpose. So as mentioned, there are so many plant ID apps available uh, through the App Store and Play Store that with our limited time, we'll be unable to present all their features and pros and cons. So out of the 200 and something apps, I would still recommend iNaturalist. So iNaturalist is 100% free. There are no ads, no hidden fees. They don't ask you for your card information. And they have a whopping 40 million ID plants and animals. They use a terrific photo recognition technology and you get user feedback for each result. This, this app was actually a, the, the master's finals project of three students at UC Berkeley. Um, it, they were in the School of Information, so they were IT people. And the app was so impressive that um, the California Academy of Sciences and the National Geographic Society jointly supported the, the creation of this app. So like other plant ID apps, the developers trained a computer to recognize the patterns in users' photos. And this is what's called computer vision. The pattern is then matched with a taxon ID suggestion and is further verified by other iNaturalist users. My personal experience with iNat is that it's been very favorable. I have uploaded about a 100 observations and 100% of the time INAT got the, the IDs correctly. So let's go to the next slide before going over the cons. So let's um, we get ourselves familiar with terminology. Needs ID. So you get this, this little flag when you've just uh, submitted an observation and it hasn't been verified by other INAT users. And then there's casual grade, wherein um, because with iNaturalist, you may be able to submit an observation without a photo or location or, or uh, date. So, but Please be prepared if there's no photo, location, and all that good stuff, your observation will be marked as just a casual grade. And it won't be, it, it won't be used for research, for scientific research. Then there is research grade, which is kind of what we all strive to achieve. So with research grade, your observation has to have several photos. So one, but it would be great to have three or five photos submitted. And then the location date must be present also. And you also have to have three iNaturalist users verify that that is indeed the plant um, that, you have, that you have submitted for, uh, the, to the database. So 
if that happens, when that happens, your observation is then flagged research grade and it can be used for scientific study. So let's briefly talk about the anatomy of an INAT observation. So in this screen, you'll see what appears to be an Android um, version of iNaturalist. So this is what's called um, uh, the My Observation um, screen. So like I've said, you have to have at least three photos. And you see the camera icon with the plus sign, click on that and add your first photo. It could be a photo that you take on the spot or it could be a photo from your phone's photo gallery. And then click again on the camera icon to add a second photo and then, and so on and so forth. So this section here, um, right now there, it, there's already a suggestion which is Dutchman's breaches, but you at first it will just be a square with a question mark and and a phrase that says like, uh, what do you see? And click on that and you would find a suggested um, taxa information. So you also have the option to type notes such as um, details on where you found the specimen and um, if, if you saw any animals, let's say, um, um, it, um, ingesting the, the plant, or if you see um, a, a lot of bees visiting it. So you can type notes such as that. If you have your, if internet is available and you, and that means you have cell service. And if you uh, opt to have location services on these three, blue arrows will autofill. So it would have the date, your location, um, et cetera. So the reason you would want to do this is because, again, if your goal is to be able to help um, scientists and be part of this citizen science project, uh, the actual coordinates would be necessary so that they know for sure that your observation was found in this location. Now, there is also a section that says, is it captive or cultivated? So there's no need to check mark this if the observation is wild. So captive or cultivated, it's one of the things that we'll be discussing later on. But if your, um, if your observation is considered wild, not planted in a garden, all that, you don't have to check mark this tick box. And lastly, you have the option to uh, make this observation of yours part of a community project. We will be discussing this also in a little bit. So, I mentioned cultivated or captive. Because um, at first, this when I was very new to iNaturalist, I, I don't know, I guess I have this Pavlovian negative uh, reaction when I hear the word captive, cultivated, and it makes me think of cultivars. And, I, and so I have made a mistake and I'll admit it that, um, that I have made a mistake and submitted some observations without check marking if it was captive or cultivated. I assumed that, hey, I'm taking pictures of native plants. And so, of course, this isn't a cultivar. So, but in fact, for iNaturalist, the, the um, meaning of captive or cultivated is this. It's a plant, whether it's, whether it doesn't matter if it's a native plant, but if it is um, purposely planted in a certain location, 
um, that means that it is captive. So let's say you go to the botanical garden and see a rattlesnake master, that even if it's native is still considered cultivated or captive because it was purposely planted in the Mobot garden. Same thing with um, Shaw Nature Reserves, Whitmer of Wildflower Garden. So if something was planted there purposely, then that is a cultivated native plant. So let's go back, bear with me here, let's go back to um, this, this slide with the cons. The reason I mentioned the definition of cultivated or captive is because I'm thinking that despite the 40 million ID plants and animals on iNaturalist, there is a possibility that some observations that uh, could have been mis mislabeled research grade. And I really am one to admit that I had made the mistake of not checking that it was a plant, a native plant from my garden, and then it had become research grade. And so it's a mistake. So please make sure that if it is a native plant that you have in your garden, you take a photo of it, mark it as cultivated or captive so that it won't reach research grade and it won't um, negatively impact the research done by scientists. <clears throat> and another uh, cons is that um, you can't seem to exit the INAT app while your photo is uploading, syncing. So it need, you have to be patient and don't exit the app, otherwise your observation won't be recorded. And <clears throat> There was also an instance wherein uh, someone asked, someone asked us like, why is it that when I took a picture of this, of this uh, plant and submitted it to iNaturalist and it, I couldn't find the right ID, the right plant. Um, and it also kind of happened to me when one time I um, had, I took a picture, several photos of Shining Blue Star, submitted it to iNaturalist, but it could only give me the genus name Blue Star. I knew it was Shining Blue Star, but I couldn't find it. And so, um, uh, so unsatisfied with, with what iNat su uh, suggested, I went to Grow Native and discovered in my research that uh, Shining Blue Star was also called Ozark Blue Star. So um, I went back to iNaturalist and I typed Ozark Blue Star. True enough, it was there. So if, imagine if I were someone new to native plants and I didn't know that there are, are multiple common names for this particular, particular plant, then I would be frustrated because I wouldn't be able to find, say, Ozark Blue Star if I didn't know that there were external um, websites such as Grow Native and other um, uh, native plant sites. So iNaturalist doesn't seem to be as user-friendly to non-experts, but they say um, to, they encourage people though to check external websites if they are unsatisfied with the suggestion, the taxa suggestion of iNaturalist. And if you have more questions, you can contact help at iNaturalist.org. So let's zoom forward, please bear with me. So this chart shows that um, first column would have PlantNet as an example, and it's a free app. And then picture this, which is a paid app, and iNaturalist, which is another free app. So the numbers, the figures may, might have changed from the last time that the information was gathered, but 
it's obvious that iNaturalist is has more um, information in their database, making it like despite the minor downsides, in my opinion, um, iNaturalist still is the best when it comes to um, the number of observations that have been submitted and the number of people who trust this app. So iNaturalist also works on all devices. So in this case, you can use iNaturalist, whether it's on your desktop, your tablet, Android, or Apple smartphone. With iNaturalist, it is essential to have internet connection and your location services on. Of course, there are um, times we're in there, you receive no cell service where, wherever you're hiking. And so in that case, you know, it obviously wouldn't work, but as much as possible, it is important to have your internet and location services on when you are wanting to use iNaturalist when you're out and about and you're wanting to make an observation. And make sure that you have the latest, um, uh, the latest update of the app and that it's also important that you sign in. Um, you, iNaturalist actually encourages you to create an account, but if you don't want to remember another, yet another password, you can log on to iNaturalist using either your Facebook or Gmail account. So this is, uh, sort of a, a, a template of what it would look like if you use an Android phone. So the first photo shows, you see the blue arrow there? It shows a plus sign. That is how you add a photo of your observation. So this first picture is actually called your dashboard. And it's the first thing you'll see. And um, the, the title there would be my observations. So as mentioned, Click on the plus sign, and that's how you will get to picture number two, which shows photos of the plants that you can input to the into the app. Again, you the, the way you add photos is you click on the camera icon with the plus sign for each and every time you want to add a photo. And then, as you can see with the second blue arrow, there would be, you click on that if you want to get taxa suggestions on the, the picture that you're submitting. And then in this case, an example would be the photo in the, the third photo, and it would be paintbrushes. So it, if you're satisfied with that, click on it, and then a check mark will appear once your observation is ready to be shared by other users. And and you need about three people to verify this observation in order for it to reach research grade. Now, here's what um, an Apple screen would look like. So instead of a plus sign, uh, look at the bottom of the first visual. So instead of a plus sign, it would be a camera icon. And like I mentioned earlier, you can either take a picture on the spot, or um, you can still click on that camera and then access your phone's photo gallery. And then the uh, same thing would happen. Um, it, it would be, uh, you'll be seeing what did you see and uh, suggestions of, um, based on the algorithm, um, the app will suggest a name. And if you're satisfied with it, then click on that. Notice that in the third picture, there is a circle with an I on the right. So it's blue and it has the letter I in a circle. Click on that. And if you are logged on to your account, you will be able to find Wikipedia information on, your, on the taxa suggested. Therefore, you can, it, you, you can rest easier that it indeed is the correct taxa 
in for your observation. And then the fourth picture shows that if you're satisfied with the, the um, suggested taxa, you can hit share and then wait for three INAT users to verify your finding. As with any plant ID app, the photo is key. And it you have to have good lighting. And by that, it doesn't have to be harsh lighting. It could be a little bit overcast, but not completely dark that you can't see the details of the plant that you are submitting. So it's very important to take close-up shots, far away shots, shots of the leaf, the flower, the stem, and, and the fruit, because you want to give iNaturalist and, or any app all the visual information you possibly can in order to receive an accurate ID. So this is an example of what I, the pictures I took of jewelweed. So I tried, it's important really to take multiple photos close up and far away. So I tried to get shots featuring the, the leaves and the flowers, um, the buds and all that. And then I also took pictures of the flowers in various angles. I was on a hike at Bluff View Park and I saw these purple flowers from afar and I was unfamiliar with them. And so I took photos of them from afar and also close-up photos, which you'll see later on. So unfortunately, the um, lighting um, conditions were different because one was in a little bit of a shaded spot and the other was in a sunny patch. But I assure you, they were the same color purple. They both had the same white centers, similar stamens, even similar buds. But then because I had submitted far away and close of shots and uh, multiple photos of each specimen, I discovered through iNaturalist that the one on the left, which you see has little hairs on the edges of the petals is Miami mist. And the other one on the right is the great water leaf. Here's another fun thing, um, using, your, using your desktop, you can also access the iNaturalist app. And this is what, this is the first thing you'll see. And this is called your dashboard. And I know that there's so many, there are so many elements here, so many clickable tabs, but here's the, here's the trick. So you see here my, my dashboard and you see the native explorer underscore STL, which is my username. So look for that, look for your username and directly underneath it, you'll see tabs, home, profile, observations, et cetera. These are the tabs that you'll frequently use and they are similar to what you have on your mobile phone. The neat thing though is so take a look on the upper left-hand side of this visual, the logo iNaturalist. Look across from that and you'll see the tabs, which are drop-down tabs, explore your observations, community, identify, and more. Click on explore and this is what you'll see. So the photo at the very back shows a world map and you can actually, um, the, so they'll, you'll see items from world all over the world. But if you plug in your zip code, let's say, or city, and which I did, and I typed in 63303, which would be the photo on the foreground, it zoomed immediately to St. Peter's. And you'll notice that there are colored pins of, of, of organisms identified in my immediate area. So the blue colored pins are for mammals, fishes, and amphibians, et cetera. 
Red would be arachnids, um, insects, mollusks. Green, of obviously, would be for plants, et cetera, et cetera. So I'll give you a second to take a look at this slide. Another interesting drop-down tab, and you'll see it in the um, picture in the background. So again, across from the iNaturalist logo, you'll see Explore Your Observations Community. This is a neat um, section of the desktop version. So under, if you hit Community, there will be a drop-down tab showing pe people. If you if you do that, you're going to see all the users um, in your particular area or worldwide. And then, um, but I, what I want to point out at this point is projects. Let's say you click on projects. The picture on the foreground right now is what you're going to be seeing, the one with the fish. So I mentioned earlier um, that when you make an observation, you may join, you may have your observation join a certain project. So briefly take a look at the picture of the mobile phone screen on, um, on the right. So you input your pictures and then the location, notes, et cetera. And you've mentioned whether it's captive or cultivated. And then at the bottom, you see there, add to projects. That's the same thing as the desktop version. So the one on the right, the picture on the right would be on your mobile phone. The picture on the left with the fish is the desktop version. So in the desktop version, you can scroll down. You'll see there the word featured. And then um, there would be, uh, as you scroll, there would be suggestions on global projects or local projects. And you can join them. And what I did was when I found one that I felt was relevant to me, I clicked on it and here's what it would look like. So I joined the project called Missouri Plants because I'm from Missouri. And you will see um, the people who also are part of that project. And I even see our friend, James Fulfell. So I, every time I made an observation and I, every time I make an observation, um, it would join the Missouri Plants Project. And so I think that this is an interesting thing to do. And with us being an organization, who knows, one day we might be interested in coming up with a project ourselves. So if you were curious on how to do that, let's look at the next screen. So there, there is a form that you can fill out called project details. And here um, you'll, you'll be, you'll, you're supposed to give a, a project name and the summary. You, here you'll be able to tell if it's um, a long-term project or one that is short-term, which could be a bio blitz. So a bio blitz is a project wherein you give a specific start date and deadline when observations need to be submitted, let's say, for example, from May 15th through July 15th, 2022. So, and then just scroll down and answer all the questions um, so that once your project is up and running, people will know what you are exactly looking for. But they, iNaturalist suggests, however, that before you start a project, please make sure that you are familiar with the iNat app. Maybe take um, several weeks or even a few months getting to know the app so that you can troubleshoot or if someone has questions, you can, as the project leader, you'll be able to give them the, uh, the most, uh, the best answer that you possibly can. And whether it's starting a project or, or managing it, or if you have any other questions, another helpful tab. Again, let's go back to the iNaturalist logo on the upper left. 
across from that, you see explore your observations, community, identify, and then more. So this more is an important drop down tab because here you will find the help, the FAQs and all that. So this is what it would look like. On the left, you'll see a help topics such as getting started, video tutorials, uh, guidelines, et cetera. And then on the right are all these FAQs and um, just scroll on it and you'll find, you're, you're going to definitely find an answer to the most uh, frequent questions about iNaturalist. So um, under the community tab, let's go back here, there. So the, um, the explore your observations community under the community drop down tab, you can also join forums. And this is a great way to get to know other INAT users, whether it's globally or locally. And let's say, for example, um, so here's a, a, some of the suggested topics. Um, let's focus on the picture in the background. So there's one for educators, there's a general nature talk, bug reports, et cetera. So I was curious about general because um, I have wanted to know a little bit more about the app. So I clicked on the topic general and this picture on the foreground is where it led me. Um, so you will find as you scroll down um, topics of discussion regarding iNaturalist features. And then of course, you know, if this, if you have other topics you would like to initiate or discuss, use this iNat form. I can't end this presentation without um, mentioning Seek by iNaturalist. So this, so there's iNaturalist and then, so it's about connecting and contributing to citizen science. And with iNaturalist, you can share the goal is to share and discuss your data with other users. But then there are people who may want to keep their observations private or they're new to exploring nature. So SEEK would be a good alternative for them. And with iNaturalist, you have to create an account and must be uh, at, um, at least 13 years old. With SEEK, kids can use the app because there's no need to create an account and um, you, there, you don't have to go online. You just download the app, app and it's kids safe and, they, and children even earn badges for their observations. That's why SEEK is a good choice for teachers and students because again, um, they, it, it, the observations can stay private to them, to their family or to their class. So would I naturalist? the photo, location coordinates, and, and those things are recorded for data quali quality assessment. When you say data quality assessment, that's uh, what iNaturalist would use to verify that this is actually um, a research grade observation. So with SEEK, there's no data collected unless you sign on using your iNat account. And as mentioned earlier, there's in, you have to log on to your account if iNaturalist using either Facebook or Google, or if you have an iNat um, username and password and in the internet connection is required. For Seek, there's no need to, um, you can use the app even without the internet. So the key notes, our, our net takeaway for this presentation is whether it's iNaturalist or any app, no algorithm is 100% accurate 100% of the time. So that's just how it is, you know, whether it's paid or free. So it's really up to you whether you want to use a, an app that's, that you can download for free and use for free, or 
if you can spend like $66.99 for a paid app. But just you know, be aware, be aware that no algorithm is 100% accurate. And regardless of what app you choose, it's very, very important to take clear, well-lit photos on a contrasting background. Take a picture of um, the organism in various angles, close up, far away shots, and different parts of the organisms in order to get a better um, taxa match. And if there's a questionable ID, take another photo. And because this topic is about identifying plants that we see um, in the wild, and, and you just want to ID that type of plant, please make sure that you take a picture of a disease-free specimen. Again, it's because you want to ID the plant and not and this isn't an app that um, identifies diseases. There's another app for that. And it's also important to remind ourselves that sometimes it's hard to tell apart plants of similar species, let's say asters, right? So that's why I really suggest taking multiple pictures of your specimen because let's say a sky blue aster, a close-up shot of it, might be, you know, kind of similar to a New England aster. But if you took far away shots, you could see that the sky blue aster is, I don't know, a third of the size of a New England aster. So um, it helps to take multiple pictures so that the algorithm or the computer would be able to better tell them apart. And of course, there's no way around it. Most apps require internet connection and for you to log on um, to your account. So, um, so that's it. And if there are any questions, let's go to Q&A. I know for sure that um, in the chat box, there was someone who inquired about taking uh, pictures, joining a project wherein uh, pictures of birds would be, could be submitted. And of course, yes, um, please submit them. But you also have to accept the fact that taking a picture of a bird would, it would be kind of tricky because they're very wary of creatures bigger than them. So still attempt to take a photo um, and as many photos as you can. And so that, that's my advice. And there, there was also a question about casual grade um, IDs. Um, I, as mentioned earlier, that there are, it's possible to submit an observation without um, pictures or location, et cetera. But this will be considered casual grade. And what this means is that it'll be low in the priority of observations. And to be honest with you, it may not even be um, verified um, or up on the list of priorities of, of observations to be verified. So just be prepared if you don't submit a photo or if um, you wanna keep location, the location of, of a place private. Um, so if you don't have all those, those elements, your observation cannot be verified by I, other INET users and therefore it would be casual grade and therefore may not be seen in the, on the app. And here are also references for the topic. Um, might be good for you guys to check other plant apps. I said there are two, like I mentioned, there are 200 plant apps available out there. So um, check them out. And 
I hope you'll find the best one for you.